started. Yeah, so I'm Andrew Jarman. Thanks very much for the introduction, Natalie. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, to talk about uh, a passion of mine, ants. Um, I mean, to get started, ants are obviously very recognizable, some of the most recognizable insects, um, and uh, their life histories are very fascinating, and they're often very important elements of uh, the ecosystems that they're in. But paradoxically, ants uh, not many people are very confident in identifying even those like the commonest species of ant. Um, so, uh, not so so identification of ants is quite difficult. It's not surprising that that um, uh, that, that it's that they're um, not that not many, many people can identify them. They are challenging. Uh, they're small, and many of the formal features to to distinguish even the commonest species through keys um, are, are quite difficult. They require experience to get to, to get to know. So uh, the purpose of the talk of this talk is to introduce you to the ants in our in our area, um, to to the species you typically find in the area, and uh, their life histories, but also how to go about starting to identify them. Um, I'm not going to go through the formal keys as such, um, but but more about the, the kind of uh, the more general ways you can you, you can look to identify them, and hopefully that will at least inspire you to. Go out and look at ants with a with a with a view to try and at least to get to know the the, uh, the most common species and maybe finding help when you uh, knowing when to find help when you have other species you want to identify. So before we get to um, actual species, I want to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of um, what ants are and um, and their, their their typical sort of natural history. So um, firstly. There's, there's no such thing, of course, as as, as um, typical, but this is as close as you get to a typical colony uh, cycle for an ant. So clearly they are social insects like um, bumblebees and honeybees and so on. Um, so they live in nests, in colonies, with most of the individuals being sterile, non-reproductive non females or workers, um, and there'll be one or more reproductive queens. Um, so this is a typical colony, colony life cycle. Um, you have a growth stage where the queen's laying eggs and they're producing more and more workers. The colony, the colony is expanding. Um, and then when it gets to a certain size, the uh, whoops, the 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 the, uh, the eggs develop into uh, the reproductive form. So the, the colony starts to produce winged females, future queens, and winged males. Um, so you go through a reproductive phase. And in a typical species, those uh, reproductive forms will leave the nest and perform sometimes very noticeable nuptial mating flights, um, where you get intermixing uh, between uh, nests of males and females. Um, so that happens over a, a, a particular times of the year, and sometimes that can be quite noticeable. Uh, the males are very short-lived. They die very soon after this. And the females um, are now... Um, prospective queens, they will remove their wings, um, and then they have to go through this task of founding the new colony. So they will shut themselves away uh, in typical, typically and lay the eggs and raise the first generation of workers. Um, and eventually the workers will appear and they will take over the running uh, of the nest and you start again through the colony. So this is a typical colony life cycle, but there are many species that um, uh, do things a bit differently. And one of the key ways in which many species differ is in this stage here, um, what, how they, the, the new queens found a new colony. And that's because this stage is the most um, risky, uh, the most dangerous stage that the colony has to go through. These individual queens are very subject to predation and, and other loss. They have to raise these workers all by themselves. Um, um, uh, and that is, a, that is a dangerous stage. So some species, uh, many species, have tried to um, adapt to make that a less risky um, part of the process. So in some cases, uh, queens will get together to found a new colony together, and so that's called pliometrosis, and that's why sometimes you'll find more than one queen in a nest. Um, and other species are very interesting because they have given up founding colonies themselves, and what they do instead is they, they will invade the nest of uh, another species, typically. Um, so these are social parasitic species, and, and those are very interesting. Okay, so um, so that talk of the colony life cycle leads me to the, to uh, 
the observation that uh, ants are obviously exist in different castes. There's uh, the males and the queens or the future queens, and they're often called gynes as well, and they're winged typically, and they remove their wings when they're found in colonies. And then you have the, the, the non-reproductive female caste, which is very different to the workers from, from the queen. Um, so we can see this very large, this, um, large pupa here, which is a queen pupa within this, this nest as a common black ant here. So um, the reason for mentioning this is because um, the, the, dis, the way you distinguish the species through keys is very different for the different castes. So typically you would need to go through a worker key or a queen key or a, or a male key um, for, 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 for the particular caste you have. So that's worth bearing in mind. And I'm, I'm going to be just concentrating on workers um, in this talk. Um, but I'm aware that many of you may come across uh, the winged forms more frequently, maybe than the workers, if you're doing sweeping uh, net with nets or, or trapping and so on. So where in general can you find ants? Um, well, it's not going to be very comprehensive, but, but the, the key thing to say really is that uh, ants in general as a whole are very warmth loving insects. Um, and so uh, especially in our in our part of, of, of the country, um, that means that they'll you, you'll typically find the most species in uh, areas that have high sunshine, a warm south or southeast facing, um, and dry uh, um, areas of not too strong vege vegetation. So short turf, uh, not too large amounts of grass, um, and south facing slopes tend to be very good. And they don't like being in waterlogged soils, so they tend to be fairly light soils. And they're often left under stones because they will attract the stones attract the heat, um, or under logs. Um, so that's that's typical. Most of our species uh, require that kind of environment. Um, so there's very little point um, uh, if you're looking for ants, especially it's very little point looking at a north-facing um, um, cliff, for instance, because uh, there really won't be very many species there. Um, the other place, of course, is, is if you trap them. So pitfall traps, uh, uh, um, ants will be a common occurrence within the pitfall trap, depending on where you set the pitfall trap. So if you set the pitfall trap in, in a, a dark, damp location, you may not find many ants in there. But if you set them in uh, a dry grassland um, location, then you, you may have quite a lot of ants in there. So... Uh, when you have ants, you have to identify that you have to identify the species, and that will uh, that you can identify quite a few of these species in the field, but that takes some experience, and I'm going to give you pointers about how to do that um, when it comes to the species. But um, really, you are going to have to collect specimens and then identify them um, using keys. And so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the the the, the kind of common way of doing this is to collect ants into tubes of alcohol. Um, I tend not to do this. I tend to just collect them in, in dry tubes because I will examine them and pin them out um, into a permanent collection um, pretty quickly. But but many people will just store them in alcohol for, for many years. Um, so you don't have to do anything more with them except to identify them. Um, yeah, so the equipment you need, so in the field, you can use a magnifying glass um, so a, a magnifying lens, and you will need at least a 15 times lens, um, but actually 20 times lens is, is preferable um, to, to see most of the species. You can identify quite a few species this way in the field, but it does take experience, so it's not going to be easy um, until you've got some, some experience. Um, but to go through the keys properly, you really need access to a, a stereo microscope. Um, this is my stereo microscope I've had for years. It's not a very sophisticated, complicated or expensive microscope that I've got, uh, but it does the job perfectly well. So, um, uh, so unfortunately, yeah, you have to go through uh, a process of identifying the, these species most of the time. But the first thing you need to know, uh, you know, to, what you need to work out is, is have you actually got an ant? Um, so if it looks like an ant, uh, hasn't got wings and looks like an ant, you've probably got an ant. Let's, let's put it that way. So, so uh, it's as simple as that. But there are things you have to be, they have to, uh, other insects and even spiders you have to be aware of that they're actually ant mimics. So this is a, an ichneumonid wasp called Gellis, um, which is quite convincingly ant-like here. Um, 
So you can distinguish these mimics, uh, mimic insects, um, quite easily because all ants have, um, all worker ants have an elbowed antenna. So the first antennal segment is longer than the rest. And so they have this elbowed antenna. You can see that definitely this mimic doesn't have that. But also more definitively, all ants have a one or two segmented waist between uh, what looks like the thorax and the, and the abdomen. I'll, I'll come to that later. But between these two parts of the body, you have this, in this case, a one segmented waist in the case of this ant here. Uh, and you see there's a constriction here in this uh, gelis, but there's no waist. Uh, there's no waist segment. It's just a constriction. So it's okay for workers. That's, that's fairly straightforward for workers. For winged casts, um, it can be more challenging, especially for the males. So these are some males of a common red ant, Myrmica ruginodis, just emerging from a, from a nest. Um, and they can, I guess, appear surprisingly un-ant-like in, in many ways. Um, in this case, it's not too difficult because this, these males have a, a, an elbowed antenna, but some males don't even have an elbowed, elbowed antenna. They have just a, a fully formed sort of antenna. But in all cases, they will still have a one or two segmented waist. So uh, you can definitively tell uh, from, from that. So once you know you've got ants, then um, um, you will need to, to use keys to identify. And the go-to book uh, for, for several decades for that, for British species in general, has been this, uh, this naturalist handbook, um, Ants, by um, Skinner and, and Allen. Um, and that has very good keys in it for both workers and queens and males, but they are they are seriously out of date because we've learned a lot more about um, uh, um, a number of species that turn out to be more than one species since 1996. Um, and the good news, is, as Natalie alluded to, is that there's a new edition of this book coming out. Um, and I have taken over from uh, Jeff Allen in producing the keys for this book. Um, so Gary is uh, still the main writer and I'm producing the keys for this book. This is, um, it's, it's, it's just about to go into press. So you, this should appear, um, hopefully, maybe later this year, if, if, we're, if we're lucky. Um, and this has keys, formal keys for, but hopefully fairly easy to use keys for, for all um, British species or species of the British Isles, um, workers and queens and males. But I'm not going to spend this talk going through um, in this kind of detail about how to tell these species apart. You, you'll probably be glad to hear, but, but you will have to use these kind of keys if you want to definitively identify your ants. Okay, that was um, sort of a general introduction. If I get down to now to, to species, um, this is the uh, this is a summary of the species found in Britain as a whole. Um, as I said, ants are warmth loving species, and so they tend to not to be very uh, abund uh, uh, diverse in North Europe, uh, Northwest Europe, um, and in Britain. So we have about forty five species in fourteen genera uh, within Britain. So they all belong to this family, Formicidae. There are four subfamilies and there are a number of genera and then a number of species. So that's um, already quite a lot of species to have to, to deal with. But if we just concentrate on, on South and Central Scotland, then actually we can simplify this a lot. Um, so we've, we, we only have two uh, ants belonging to two subfamilies um, in, in our part of, uh, uh, of, of Britain um, and only five genera. And some of those, two of the genera, only have one species as well. So that greatly simplifies things in terms of uh, trying to get your head around uh, even the commonest uh, species. Um, so I'll be going through um, these species, uh, well, well, most of these species overall, but just to kind of get started, I'm just going to go dive straight in and talk about the two most likely species that you're going to come across. Uh, in most contexts, um, in, in, if you're recording. So it's uh, a species on this side, Myrmica ruginodis, and on this side, Formica lemani. So these are the two you're most likely going to come across in any typical day in the field, um, because they're the most hardy um, species we have, and they will, they are a bit of an exception where they will nest in most, in very windswept or um, uh, cold or sometimes uh, overgrown uh, uh, woodland kind of conditions. Um, so Myrmica ruginodis is what you can call the common red ant. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the Latin names, but I'm going to also try and give you 
um, vernacular names where, where possible, but, but uh, that's not always possible for ants. Not many of them do have proper um, English names. Um, so this is the common red ant. This is Formica lamani, which I'm calling the north, northern large black ant in this context. These are um, very widespread, very abundant, um, as you can see from the records. These are records, summary of records from the Biwa's um, website. Um, I think you can see already, already though, that within our region which, here, that um, there's, a, there's basically a, a, a massive under-recording of all ant species. So even these two species here, which as you can see, there's been a lot of recording up in the highlands, uh, both species. There's no reason to think that these species are not equally abundant in South and Central Scotland, and yet records are very localized. And that is of course because um, recorders uh, who have identified ants are very localized. Um, there's one in Edinburgh myself, <laughs> which might be quite obvious from some, from some of these maps. So there's a lot you can do, a lot of, in terms of helping to map these species, even these two uh, um, um, most common species, it, there's a lot of work that can be done just to record these two species. And as I say, these are the two you're likely to find um, in most locations. This is Formica lamani, a northern large black ant, um, and this is it typically nesting under a stone. Uh, this is Blackford Hill, just around the corner from where I live in Edinburgh. Um, you can see here uh, the cocoons. So, so these are pupae. In this species, they're enclosing co cocoons. Uh, quite a large, um, quite a, a rapidly moving species. And then this is Myrmica ruginodis, the common red ant. Um, and uh, it lives uh, in, in, in wide variety of locations, even quite cold and exposed moorland, windswept moorland. Um, uh, you see it's a generally quite bright red. Uh, and you can see also here that the pupae aren't enclosed in cocoons. I hope you can see that fairly clearly here. You can see that um, they're naked pupae. You can actually see the outlines of the pupae there. So that's quite a difference between those species. So those are the two commonest species. And actually it's quite convenient because they are good representatives of the two different subfamilies of ants, the uh, Myrmicini uh, and the Formicini. So Myrmica and Formica are uh, representatives of those two subfamilies. So it means that if you uh, um, spend any time finding ants in the south and central Scotland, you're going to get very familiar already, uh, very quickly, with the two subfamilies of, of, of ants that we have. And this just some this kind of emphasizes those differences between the subfamilies here. So this is Myrmica ruginodis and um, the thing that distinguishes myrmicine ants is the spine on the end of the um, what looks like the thorax, uh, but actually it's called the mesosoma. So I, I'll point out here that um, even though this, this looks like the thorax and this is the abdomen, formally this is known as the mesosoma. Um, and that's because this part of the thorax is actually part of the, the abdomen. Um, and then the segments of the waist are also part of the abdomen. And then the rest of the abdomen is called the gaster because it's not the whole abdomen. So that's a bit of a complication and I'm kind of introducing it here because if you are using keys, then you're going to see mesosoma and gaster used in keys rather than abdomen um, and the thorax. So, um, Myrmica ruginodis uh, is a typical myrmicine ant. In, it has these clear spines on the end of its uh, mesosoma and it has a two-segmented waist. So the waist consists of two segments and ants of this subfamily also tend to be very wrinkly. Uh, as you can see here, very furrowed. So Formica lamani um, is a typical formicine in that it doesn't have spines on the end of its mesosoma and it has only one segment in its waist. Uh, as you can see, this kind of upright part of the segment of scale. Um, and it tend, and ants of this subfamily are not wrinkly. They, they tend to have a fairly smooth surface. So it's really quite easy to, um, to distinguish these, these subfamilies, uh, especially using these, spe these species. Um, some other interesting differences are that, that ants of this type of family have a sting. I um, don't think you can quite see it on this image here, but they have a sting. Um, um, most of them are too small to really to, to, to affect us in terms of stinging. Ants of this type family, um, they are famously, uh, famously the wood ants are in this type family and they, they're famous for squirting acid, for spraying acid. They've lost their sting and they spray acid instead. And as I pointed out on the videos, ants of the myrmicine subfamily, the pupae are naked. Um, so if you're exposing a nest and you see naked pupae, you know you've got a myrmicine ant, most likely a myrmica already. Uh, ants of this subfamily have 
pupae um, enclosed in cocoons. So if you expose a nest under a stone and you see cocoons, you automatically know already that it's a myrmacine, uh, uh, sorry, a formicine ant. So either formica or lassius in, in this case. So, so far so good, and that sounds like very straightforward. But the problem is that even these two very common species have um, other species related to them that are quite hard to distinguish from them. So I'm calling these for the purpose of this talk confounding species because these are species you have to exclude even to record the common species to, as a proper biological record. Um, so in the case of Formica lamani, there's a very closely related species called Formica fusca. Um, I'm calling it here the southern large black ant, um, which is the common species in the south. Um, but you can see there are some records of Formica fusca um, in Scotland, not in our area, um, not in, in this area at the moment, but it's probably just a matter of time before some uh, uh, records are found in our area too. So Formica fusca um, is much more heat uh, and dry uh, loving, not dry soil loving than Formica lamani that can put up with very exposed kind of conditions. Um, so it's only gonna be found in very sheltered locations uh, um, within in Scotland. Um, but it is something you have to bear in mind. Um, you can't look at a, find a formica black, formica ant, and automatically assume it's going to be formica lamani. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time it is going to be, but um, if you want to have a definitive record, then you have to really check, you have to rule out the possibility of formica fusca. Um, so the way you do that is quite simple. Um, and you can actually do this with a lens in the field, so it's not too difficult to do it with a bit of experience. And that is that um, Formica lamani has this group of hairs sticking up on the back of the, of the front of the mesosoma. And Formica fusca doesn't have those, it's completely bald there. So if you, can, if you can see hairs under the lens or under the microscope, you can be guaranteed you've got Formica lamani. Um, so it's quite easy to distinguish them. Um, it's very tedious to have to do it all the time because uh, I do it all the time when I'm recording uh, in our area, uh, just checking, but most of the time, it's going to be Lamani, but you do have to ex exclude Formica fusca. So the other black formicine species that, um, that um, can be confused with Formica lamani is Lassius niger, which is the common or garden black ant. Um, and so for, for many of you, if you um, have a garden in a, in a lowland kind of area, then you very likely to have this in your garden. But actually be careful because Formica lamani in Scotland is equally, uh, can be equally found in gardens as well. So especially if those gardens, uh, if, you're, if you live in quite a high up, a high altitude area or in areas that's quite exposed. Um, but otherwise, this is Lassius niger. This is the ant that probably most people uh, kind of know from, from their gardens. Um, you can see it's very widely spread. Um, and again, quite under-recorded in our area, but actually some of that is not under-recording. It is actually much more local. Uh, it's very um, connected to um, human activity. So very much in urban locations, especially in Scotland, but also coastal locations. So it's very abundant along the East Lothian coast uh, in the dunes, for instance sheltered river valleys in, in, in the highlands, um, and, and so on. Um, and this is the ant that you would most think of when you, when you think of uh, ant swarms. So this is in my garden, and this is the uh, time of the year in August when the, when the, the winged forms are being released from, from this nest in my, in my garden. So these are the ones that, these are the ants that release, this is the species that release all its winged forms from all colonies over a large area um, at the same time in a synchronized mass exodus. And uh, certainly in Southern England, uh, those, those releases are so large that they, they usually make the, lose, the news as flying ant day. Um, um, they're not quite as noticeable up here, but they still have this, this sort of max, mass exodus. So that's Lassius niger. It's the, it's, uh, it forms very populous colonies, um, but it's in more sheltered locations where, where we are, but certainly very, um, urban as well. Um, so how do you separate Lassius niger from the Formica species, from Formica lamani? Um, so it's smaller, the species is smaller. Uh, formally, it's actually not that straightforward to separate them. So the keys will give you this sort of character. And I'm giving you this 
um, at, uh, as an example of how of how much detail you're going to have to go through in some of the keys. So these are different species. These are these are not um, the two species I'm talking about. They're brown. It's kind of easier to, easier to see the characters on these on these brown and red species here. This is a Lassia species. This is a Formica, and the keys make use of many characters, but one of the uh, ones they often use is the shape of this little opening here. This is an opening called a spiracle, which is one of the um, airway openings for, 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 for the insects. Um, and in Lassius, the opening is circular. Uh, and in Formica, the opening is, is a slit. And it's not that easy a character to, to see, but what is more obvious is that um, the location of the spiracle is slightly different. Uh, this is now looking down on the back of, of, of the ant. And for Lassius, the location of the spiracle is on the curved surface as you go from the side to the rear. So, so if you're looking at it straight on, you're actually looking at this kind of angle. In Formica, this opening is along the, the side surface itself before it gets to the curve. So if you're looking at it straight on, you're looking at this sort of angle. So it's not that difficult to, to do, but of course, um, it takes experience and it takes um, comparison of some specimens of Lassius with specimens of Formica the first time you, you do it. And this is the kind of thing that is quite a barrier to, I, I think, you know, that you, you, your regular nat naturalist trying to get into identifying ants. But if you can get over that barrier, then I think you can find that these, these you know, it's not so difficult to do this kind of identification. But having said that, with a bit of experience, if you have identified them, it's actually quite easy to tell them apart in the field just by their kind of their behavior. Um, so the way that they forage is subtly different. This is this is some videos here. I'm just going to show you. This is Lassius niger. These are both from, from my back garden, rather messy back garden. This is Lassius niger. And you can see it walking, running around, and it's like a little clockwork. Um, sort of mechanism and it kind of stops now and again but it never really stops completely it kind of even when it stops it's still kind of quite active and, and moving around so that's Lassius niger and this is Formica lamani and it looks quite different it's very jerky it's it starts and stops in its movement so um that is something to, to something to look out for and it will give you some confidence that you're looking at these different species and it will also give you some confidence in going through the keys that you kind of half know what you might be looking for and eventually you'll be able to be able to identify these um, um without even collecting specimens i mean you, you, you know you can you can see the differences between these species and the way i like to remember this um is that the lassius niger resembles a starling in that starlings kind of walk around uh, continuously and and uh, they, they, they rarely pause whereas formica lamani resembles a blackbird where it, which hops around and then stops and looks looks and listens and hops around a bit further so if that helps you to memorize the difference then 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 good okay so unfortunately again there are um, complications so lassius niger you can distinguish it from formica but there are, there's a closely related species of Lassius um, called Lassius platythorax. And again, it's not a very common species, at least in our area, um, but it's one that has to be borne in mind that it might be a, poss a possibility when you have a Lassius niger. So they're very hard to distinguish um, morphologically, and I'm not even going to try and explain how to do it in, in this talk. In terms of um, environment, Lassius platythorax is much more characteristic of natural habitats and it's usually associated with dead wood. Either it lives within dead wood or underneath a stump uh, or underneath a log, uh, but also within log as well. Unfortunately, Lassius niger will sometimes do that. So it will live underneath a log, but not necessarily within log. Um, so you can't use this definitively. But if you find a Lassius niger in an urban environment, in a garden or on sand dunes or whatever, then it's very, very, very unlikely to be Lassius platythorax, but if you find it in a, a, a wood kind of environment, then you have to consider that Lassius platythorax might be involved. And you can see we don't have many records in our location, but there is one here, a quite a recent record in, in I think, I guess the Sterling sort of area. Um, but it's, that's more likely that it's, that, it, it, that it's just not been found yet. It, it probably does occur within our um, uh, region more, more widely. Okay, so moving on from the black ants, the black formazines, this is the next ant I want to talk about, which is uh, Lassius flavus. Um, 
And this is known as the yellow meadow ant or the yellow hill ant. So this might be another one that if you do know anything about ants, you, you would have come across before, at least in terms of uh, uh, reading about them. So very widespread species um, and probably one of, one of the most abundant species in Britain. But it's quite inconspicuous because it has a subterranean lifestyle. So it only lives, it, it rarely comes to the surface. It lives permanently underground. But what makes it sometimes conspicuous is that this is the famous ant that forms these famous ant hills in, in old pasture. Um, so uh, this is actually North Berwick Law, uh, the lower, sort of lower area of it. And you can hopefully see some of these kind of hill, these kind of little mounds here. And these are Lassius flavus mounds. So in fact, you can record this species just on the basis of, 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 of that. Um, if you open up those mounds, you will see these, these, these yellow workers with inside them. Um, so yeah, characteristic mounds in, in pastures, hills in pastures, but not only that, you also find it under stones or within lawns um, equally frequently as well. So it's not just only uh, in hills. Um, in some locations, the, the, so, the, so these hills are in danger of being um, shaded out, either by the grass getting very long and rank or by you know, the gorse growing, uh, you know, the spreading of gorse. Um, and I'm kind of reminded that actually that, that you find this species in Holyrood Park in Edinburgh, um, but it's kind of holding on barely because the, uh, the locations where it's found along the south slopes of the, of, of the crags, um, the, 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 it's getting quite shaded out by long, by very rank long grass um, and also um, growth of gorse. So this forms very populous, very populous colonies, um, but, but uh, of many, many of tens of thousands of, 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 um, of ants. So again, unfortunately, um, the, there are other species of Lassius that, uh, that this ant can be confused with. Um, so there are rare sweet yellow Lassius species. So the two most likely ones in our region are Lassius mixtus and Lassius umbratus. They look very much like Lassius flava, so you can't really tell them apart just for, uh, from, from, from eyeballing them. They're much, much rarer. Um, so the only re close record, or nearby record I know for Lassius umbratus is when I found it at Tors Warren um, in Dumfries and Galloway. So it's nesting underneath and within this log on the beach. Um, and Lassius mixtus, you can see there's not many records. In fact, these recent records in the highlands and along the coast here are all my records. Um, so it's probably not that common a species in Scotland, but it's also very hard to find because it's subterranean, and, um, but also it's very hard to distinguish from, from Lassius flavus. So the reason I wanted to talk about these a bit more though is because they have very interesting life histories. And that is unlike um, the other species I've spoke, spoken up to about so far, um, these, uh, the queens of this species found their nests th through the social parasite sort of route. So in other words, the queens of Lassius mixtus and Lassius umbratus, they don't, uh, once they've mated and removed their wings, they don't found a new nest by themselves. They seek out established colonies of other Lassius species and they try to infiltrate, invade those colonies and take them over. And what they would typically do is they'll infiltrate the colony um, and sometimes they will get killed by the workers, sometimes they're successful. And if they're successful, the workers eventually seem to kill their own queen and then the workers will raise the brood of the parasitic species, the social parasitic species, um, and then, then that, those will then hatch into to new workers of the parasitic species, and eventually the old workers of the host species will die out, and so it become a, a, will become a, a, a pure colony of the parasitic species. So this has a very interesting kind of life history, um, and if you're very lucky, you can actually come across some of the queens of these species where they're, where they're hunting out uh, a nest to invade. So I'm going to take you through um, uh, some, some videos here and uh, of a, an occasion where I found uh, a Lassius mixtus queen um, after it had been mated um, and it was searching for an, a, a Lassius flavus host colony to invade. Uh, so I found this in between Yellow Craig and Gullen. Um, and it's found along, it was found along the strand line of the beach. I recognized what it was and I took it home and I also took home some workers from a Lassius flavus colony in order to see what would happen uh, under the microscope in a, in a little container. So I put them in a container and immediately the 
Asius Vixus Queen grabbed one of the Asius Flasus workers and, and basically killed it. So the video is not that good quality. That's because I was trying to keep the, low, the lighting level quite low just so I could observe what's going on. The Asius Flavus worker is putting up quite a fight there. Um, but it's it's um, basically it's doomed. It's going to be uh, killed. So this, so these queens, this is typical behavior of these queens. Um, as a prelude to entering the host nest, they will grab a worker and kill it, and then they will carry it around for many for several hours with the worker in their in its jaws. Uh, and it's not quite clear what it's doing, but it seems it may be just absorbing some of the the colony odor from that worker from the dead worker. Um, to help it to invade the nest. So I had other I added other workers to this to this little um, um, container here with this queen. And by the next morning, these Lassius Flavus workers had almost had pretty much accepted the Lassius Mixtus queen as their own. So you can see they're surrounding the queen like they would do their own queen. There's a couple of workers who aren't quite so sure, they kind of have this jerky behavior. This one's got its mandibles open, it's not quite so sure maybe. But this queen does eventually got accepted and it laid its eggs and the workers raised the, 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 um, the new uh, uh, parasite um, um, workers. Okay, so that was a bit of a side, but a bit to show you some of the kind of interesting life histories that some of our ants have. Um, how do you try to distinguish um, Lassius flavus from these species in, in the field? You can so you'll come across mostly again Lassius flavus as the as the yellow ant that you come across. The easiest way I find to to distinguish, at least in the first instance, is that Lassius flavus has workers that are variable in size. So this is Lassius, Lassius flavus, and this is a large worker, and this is a much smaller worker in the same nest. Um, that is very typical of Lassius flavus, and you just don't see that for these species. They they have yellow workers, but they're always very uniform in size. So if you come across under a stone or something, the yellow Lassius workers, uh, and they look uniform in size, then you can immediately suspect that it might be Mixtus or, or Umbratus. But most of the time, you're going to find that they're, they're variable in size, and they, you can be fairly, fairly safe that those are going to be Lassius flavus. Okay, so moving on. Well, the time is moving on. So I will move on to uh, the the um, the... Uh, we, we've now dealt with the Formicene ants, Formica and Lassius, and I'm now moving on to, to the Myrmicene ants. I've already, already introduced Myrmica, and we have two other genera to introduce, Leptothorax and Tetramorium. So, so the Myrmica ants, these are the red ants, uh, I introduced as Myrmica ruginodis. They're abundant everywhere, usually red, and they can be quite aggressive. And there are four species that are uh, fairly common uh, in our area. And the way you normally tell these apart is by focusing on the base of the antenna, the first segment of the antenna, which is known as the scape. So you're looking down uh, from the back of the head, you can see the shape of the scape. And in term, for, for two of the species, the common red ants, Ruginodis and Rubra, this is a very slender curved scape. For the other two, um, the, the scape is abruptly bent at the base. At, at the base. And these are sometimes, because of that, known as elbowed red ants because of this kind of elbow here. So this is Scabrinodis and Sabuleti. So the common red ants, uh, Mumica ruginodis and Rubra, I'm not going to go much into how to distinguish, but basically Rubra has a much shorter spine than ruginodis. And it's actually, it's very common in Britain as a whole, but in our area, it tends to be very quite, quite local and coastal and, and sheltered areas. And for the elbowed red ants, um, these are, are more local than Ruginodis, but, uh, and Scabrinodis is the most common of the two. But in, in our area, well, in our area, Scabrinodis is going to be quite widely distributed. But along the coastal air part of our area, up here especially, and probably along the coast down here, uh, Myrmica sabuleti is the most abundant uh, Myrmica, actually. So um, that's the ant you can find very commonly along the, the coastal areas but not in land uh, um, very much at all. Um, how you distinguish these is by looking at the shape of the base of the antenna. And I'm not gonna go spend much time in looking at detail at this, except to say that these are the two elbow red ants with the, with the uh, uh, angle at the base, but Sabuleti has uh, a kind of a big sort of outgrowth 
associated with the angle. As you hopefully can see that here as it's moving the antennae. Sometimes these are much easier to see in living ants than it is in, in, in dead specimens. Um, these, these sort of differences. You can see that kind of this outgrowth here. Yeah, there it is there. Um, there's another species of Myrmica um, called Myrmica lobicornis, which I'm going to mention because it's quite um, not found very often, but it's very widespread. Um, and uh, the reason it's not found often is simply because the colonies tend to be very isolated from each other. So if you find the colony, it's the only colony you're going to find the whole day in that location. But it is a typical moorland ant, so it is one that we find quite, we have quite a lot in, in, in our sort of area. And it's easy to tell apart from the other Myrmicas because it has, the, has this really nice tooth sticking up from it, from the base of its antenna, from its scape. Okay, so um, I see that I'm sort of running out of time. Uh, am I okay to carry on for another, hopefully, maybe five minutes? If, if not, just let me know. Um, it's just fine, I... Andrew, keep going. Okay, right. So, um, so for the other uh, Myrmicene genera, Leptothorax, there's one species, Leptothorax acerborum, and then for Tetramorium, there's Tetramorium cispitum. And they are Myrmicene, so they have the two segments of the waist and they have spines, and they tend to be smaller. So if you do come across these you'll, and, and you've got used to looking at Myrmica, then you may notice them as being small, looking like small dark Myrmicas. Um, so uh, yeah, there's other differences. So, so Leptothorax, if I go to the next slide, yeah, Leptothorax, um, it also looks very distinctly bicolored compared with Myrmica. Letothorax is a very um, inconspicuous species, but it's very widespread and probably very, very common, uh, even in our location around here, even though there's not many records there. It's going to be a very common species, but it's quite inconspicuous. It lives in very small colonies. Um, so if you, if you look at it for ants enough and you come across lots of Myrmica, eventually you're going to come across a small, bicolored, timid Myrmica, and that will be Letothorax acerborum. So I've called it a slender carpenter ant, but it's not really, that's not really a, that's not a, it's not a recognized name for it. Um, I call it that because typically, at least down south in England, it lives in dry, hard, dead wood. Um, in Scotland, you're more likely to find it nesting in the peat crust uh, of dry, of, of dry moorland or under stones even. So be aware that, um, that, that um, you can't just rely on this living in dead wood. And in the field, it looks very different from Myrmica. So it has this very um, elegant kind of gliding motion that it has, um, which is very different from the kind of rather bumbling um, Myrmica species. And I guess finally, I wanted to uh, talk about Tetramorium sea spittum. And this is probably one of the most interesting species we have just because of this. If you look at the distribution, it looks very kind of uh, very wacky, right? So. Tetramorium sea spittum is sometimes called a square shouldered ant um, because the front of the thorax is kind of squared off like that. But basically, it's a very small um, blackish brown uh, myrmicine ant. Um, can be confused with Leptothorax, except this ant lives in much large co co large colonies and it can be quite aggressive. Um, and it has a different number, number of antennal segments to, to, um, if you want to look at it carefully. Um, this is what it looks like before going on to the distribution in the field. So this is in on a cold day in April, so it's moving quite slowly here. This is Holyrood Park in Edinburgh. So why this distribution? So if you speak to anybody about who knows anything about ants, about where, where you find Tetramorium sea spittum, um, they'll say, oh yeah, hot lowland um, heaths in southern England or Brecklands or the coast, hot coasts. And the surprising thing is that you have this massive gap between these records and then you have these records up in, 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 in basically East Lothian and the borders. And the locations in which, uh, these, these are all my records, by the way, along the coast here. And I, was, I was actually gobsmacked when I first moved to Edinburgh and found this species up here. Um, so these locations are very characteristic. They have uh, some things that are clearly in common. They're, they're mostly coastal. And there are volcanic outcrops and other or otherwise basalt kind of outcrops. So even small outcrops of this rock, like in Abilady or St. Ab Head, St. Ab's Head, um, can be a good location to look for this species. Um, it used to be found on Blackford Hill as well in Edinburgh, but um, that's been recently, I think, extinguished by the Himalayan dorsum that's um, crowded it out. So 
this is very much a heat loving species so it's coastal rocky coastal in it in, in in scotland um and it very easily um uh, made extinct by just just by growth of grass or by by um, um gorse and so on and interestingly there are some historical records from the 1800s which i initially thought were were probably wrong from Ailsa Craig and, and Bass Rock. Um, and again, this fits very nicely now that, that this is the kind of location you find this, this species. So it's, it's definitely one to look out for, um, for along more areas of the coast that might be south facing uh, volcanic kind of rock. And it's probably going to be found in on the coast of Fife as well, I imagine, and maybe even Dumfries, um, and maybe at the coast uh, up the coast of Aberdeen. So that's definitely something to look out look out for. So I will move on and just mention lastly is that um, um, the, the ant that many people will know as typically ant, uh, being ant, is, is called the wood ants, uh, the formica species of uh, wood ant that form these large mounds up in the highlands and so on. Unfortunately, we don't have those in our area, um, really. Um, I still hope that maybe someone's going to find some someday, um, but... It's kind of a, a rather vain hope, really. Um, so the two species that are present in Scotland, uh, you can see there's just this big gap in our area here where they're not present. So the closest locations we have are the Formica lugubris in Northumberland here, um, or Formica aquilonia, the Scottish wood ant, in Queen Elizabeth Park here um, near Aberfoyle. I still hope that one day someone's going to find some in, in, in the borders or, or whatever, but um, and, and if they do, it may be Formica lugubris because that's the ant that's said to be more capable of spreading into new plantations. Uh, so, so you never know. But it's such a it's such a um, conspicuous ant that it's very hard to think it could be overlooked. Okay, so that's it. So finally, I just um, mentioned that it, hopefully, if this has inspired you to have a look at ants a bit more, then you can find help, um, especially by going to the Beeswax and Ants Recording Society website, um, Beeswax website. Um, there, there, there are pages on every species of, of ant, but also of, of all bees and wasps and solitary bees and solitary wasps. Um, and they have an active, very active Facebook group. Um, and you, if you do have any uh, questions or, or photographs that you, you, you're very um, welcome to post on the Facebook group and get some input in, into that. It's also very good to just to join. It's a very wide um, membership. You don't have to be a specialist in order to join this. There's um, lots of very general natural naturalists uh, that are members. So that, that's it. So um, I hope it, you didn't mind me overrunning a little bit there, but um, uh, hopefully it was interesting enough. And if you have any questions, I'll be really, really happy to to, to answer them.